All right, well, let's get going. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our weekly speaker series webinar. That's a deep dive with our staff to learn more about the many ways that we're working to end extinction. I'm Tiara Curry, a senior scientist in our Saving Life on Earth campaign. And before we get started, I wanna share a little good news roundup with you. And then we'll talk about the amazing wildlife of Africa. So today we awarded the Rose Braz Award for bold activism to Nayeli Kobo. She is a 19 year old environmental justice advocate who's been working to protect her community in Los Angeles from oil well pollution since she was nine years old. So congratulations Nayeli and we are rooting for you. The governor of South Carolina today signed a bill banning the commercial trade of wild turtles, which is amazing. We've been working on that for a long time. The Puerto Rico Harlequin butterfly was proposed for Endangered Species Act protection after an 11 year wait. The relic dace, a little fish in Nevada, got a deadline for a decision on its Endangered Species Act protection for later this year. A judge in New Mexico sided with the center in a challenge from the Cattlemen's Association trying to take away critical habitat for the New Mexico meadow jumping mouse, the cute little animal you see in the corner of your screen. Other successful lawsuits resulted in the Environmental Protection Agency agreeing to crack down on smog pollution from oil and fracking in eight states and to enforce sulfur dioxide reductions in two states. A judge in North Carolina sided with the center and denied a motion by the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill to dismiss claims that its coal-fired power plant was burning coal more than it's permit, permitted to. And we're still working on shutting it down entirely, but that was a, a little step in the right direction. So even with all the terrible things that are happening, we're making progress on many fronts across the entire country. And we're so grateful for your help and support in these battles. We've got a great webinar for you this evening with our international program. We're gonna save time for your questions at the end. Tanya and Sarah, our guests who will introduce themselves in a minute, will be on Slack tomorrow from noon to one Pacific to continue the conversation. After the webinar, you'll get an email with instructions on how to join Slack if you're not on there, and it will have an action alert that you can take to help end wildlife trade. And we'll post this video tomorrow at savelifeonearth.org. Just scroll down to the speaker series. So now we're gonna talk about some of the amazing work we're doing in Africa, and I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah and Tanya to introduce themselves. Well, hi, I'm Sari Ullman. I'm our International Program Director working out of my basement in Seattle. And I'm Tanya Sandrab. I'm the International Program's Legal Director and I'm working in my attic in Seattle. <laughs> so I'm not in a basement in Seattle, in, in Seattle anymore. I was in a basement in Portland like my first four years at the center. <laughs> Um, Sarah, tell us about the international program and give us a brief overview of wildlife trade. Sure thing. Uh, just making sure I am off mute. I am. Great. All right. Um, well, thanks, Tiara. And hello, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Um, so our international program here at the center is a pretty small shop. There are only four of us. But our work really sp excuse me, spans the globe. We've worked on dugongs in Japan, emperor penguins in Antarctica, cloud forests in Ecuador, and of course, what today's webinar is about, wildlife in Africa. Um, we do our work by following the center's classic model using science and critically the law to protect wildlife and habitats no matter where they're found. So in general, our work falls in two categories. One is focusing here within the United States using U.S. laws like the U.S. Endangered Species Act. And if you've been attending these webinars regularly, I'm sure you're familiar with that law. Um, using the statute to protect species abroad. I think some people are surprised to learn that U.S. law protects species outside of the U.S. borders, but there are around 600 foreign species listed under our Endangered Species Act, or ESA. Um, so why is that? Why does U.S. law protect foreign species? A few reasons. Um, listing can bring important funding for wildlife and highlight their threats to the world. And critically, once a species is listed under the Endangered Species Act, the law bans imports. So in general, you can't bring that animal or plant into the United States for the wildlife trade, although there are a few exceptions there. Um, 
The other thing we do is work at the international level under treaties to get more species and habitat protected worldwide. So it's just one example. We work under the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, or CITES. This is a treaty that regulates and prohibits trade in imperiled animals and plants, as its name suggests. Um, there are a bunch of other treaties we work under, World Heritage Convention, Convention of Migratory Species. Um, but I really wanted to focus on CITES um, because wildlife trade is, is a really big focus in our international program. And that's because it's a really big problem. Um, last year, UN scientists issued a report finding that 1 million species are facing extinction within the coming decades. And one of the greatest drivers of that threat, exploitation, including trade. Um, and it turns out that the United States is one of the world's biggest importers of wildlife. We consume about 20% of the wildlife traded globally. That's hundreds of millions of animals and plants imported each year for things like pets and clothing and decor, hunting trophies and um, medicinal products. Um, so I would add in this age of COVID that this trade not only risks the world's biodiversity, it's also a disease risk. And as we are all um, now well aware, live animals can harbor diseases like COVID Ebola, monkey pox. And when we capture these animals or disturb their habitat, the diseases can transfer to humans. So Tanya just issued a great report about this last month, connecting US wildlife imports to disease risk. And I really encourage everyone to take a look at it. It's, it's just fascinating. Um, but enough of the overview, let's dig into African wildlife. All right, thank you, Sarah. Tanya, let's talk about giraffes. And I gotta tell you, when you started working on giraffes, I was like, giraffes, they can't be in trouble. There's so many of them. So tell us, tell us all about them and about your work to save them. Well, thanks and good evening or afternoon, everyone. I appreciate being here. Um, Tira sort of gave away my first slide, but I was gonna ask you guys the question, what's the land mammal that has the highest blood pressure and stands the tallest? And I actually think my first slide probably gives it away too. It's the giraffe. Um, and whether you love their beautiful, intricate coats, their long eyelashes and tongues and necks, whatever brings you to them, they truly captivate our imaginations. Um, and as Sarah was just saying, sadly, giraffes have been undergoing what's been called a silent extinction. There are fewer giraffes left in the wild in Africa than there are elephants. And I have to pause there because, wow, who would have thought that, right? But yeah, there's close to only about 100,000 giraffes left in the wild. They've undergone a 40% population decline over the past three generations. And so that's why we started working on the species, not only because everyone loves them, but because they desperately need our help. So what are the main threats to giraffes? Well, their habitat loss and fragmentation, civil unrest and poaching or illegal hunting, but trade is also a factor for the species. And I wanna talk about that and warn you guys first though, that the next slide can, does contain a giraffe trophy on it. So when we started looking at giraffes, we looked at, well, what role does the US play in giraffe trade? Cause you don't really think a lot about huge demand for giraffes, but it turns out there actually is a really big demand in the US. So between 2006 and 2015, the US imported more than one giraffe trophy a day over 21,000 giraffe bone carvings. But that's not it, we import all sorts of things. We import giraffe skin pillowcases, Bible covers, and lots of giraffe bones. And unfortunately, and really sort of alarmingly, giraffe bone is starting to be used as a substitute for elephant ivory in a lot of products. Now, just one thing I have to point out to you guys, if you're looking at that giraffe trophy, that's like a seven to nine foot tall trophy. I don't know about you, but I don't have a space in my home for that. Well, so how are we helping giraffes? What can we do? Um, here at the center, we use the tools that Sarah was just talking about. Um, the first thing that we did is we supported a proposal submitted at CITES to regulate trade in giraffes. This is called an Appendix 2 listing, and this protection ensures that trade in giraffes and their parts is regulated. It requires export permits and findings to be made before the species can leave a country. 
The other thing though that the listing does it, is it requires CITES parties to report annually on their giraffe trade. So that means we get a lot of information about giraffe trade, where it's coming from, where it's going to, and that's gonna really help us keep an eye on threats to the species. The other thing we did though, is we focused domestically here in the US. I mean, we have a substantial trade in drafts occurring. We have a big demand for draft parts. So we worked with allies to petition the US Fish and Wildlife Service to protect drafts under the Endangered Species Act. And if drafts get listed, it'll give us a couple of tools to help them. So the first is the listing in and of itself helps increase awareness about draft silent extinction. It helps draw attention to drafts plight and that's really important. It also can increase funding for draft conservation and that's best desperately needed, especially in terms of looking at habitat conservation and connecting habitat for drafts. But second, if drafts are listed as endangered, only draft imports that actually benefit giraffes in the wild, either through research or enhancement of the survival of the species would be allowed into the US. So this is that ban on imports that Sarah was talking about. And that would be really crucial because it stops all of those products made out of drafts from coming into the US. Now, some of you may have noticed this, but we're gearing up to sue if necessary over the need for a 12 month finding for drafts. So stay tuned in the near future for draft actions. Thanks, Tanya. And I'm so glad that you're helping them because I just, I'm bowled over by how many giraffes the United States imports. I don't think most people know that they're in trouble or that the US plays a big role in that. So I'm super grateful for the work you're doing. All right, now we're gonna talk about some wildlife weirdos. Sarah, I know you love these guys. Tell us about pangolins and sea cucumbers. I would love to. Um, so moving from some of Africa's most graceful and iconic creatures that Tanya works on, some of Africa's little known, but I would argue still lovable oddballs. Um, so I'm gonna talk about pangolins and sea cucumbers. And these are both animals that are deeply threatened by trade. So starting with the pangolin, I think a lot of folks still don't quite know what these guys are. They are obviously adorable. They are the only mammal with scales and they are covered from tip to tail with them. And I even have to admit, I love these, these critters, but they do look a little bit odd. Maybe a pine cone or a walking artichoke is what our, our media guy calls them. Um, one of their more adorable features is that the moms carry their babies on the backs. Um, and pangolins also curl up into a cute little ball when they're scared. And um, this is actually a really effective defense against predators because the ends of all those scales are actually quite sharp. Um, unfortunately, this behavior makes pangolins quite vulnerable to poaching as they're pretty easy to catch in this posture. Um, and poached they are. Pangolins are the most trafficked mammal in the world. It's estimated that more than a million pangolins were captured and traded in just a single decade. Not surprisingly, this level of poaching is causing population declines um, throughout the pangolins range, which includes Africa. Um, so why are pangolins so in demand? And the answer is primarily for their scales. There's a long held belief within traditional Chinese medicine that pangolin scales hold curative properties, helping to disperse blood and promote lactation. Um, pangolin meat is also considered a delicacy in some parts of Asia. So initially we saw declines in the Asian uh, pangolin populations. There's four species in Asia and four species of pangolins in Africa. But as those species became increasingly rare, African pangolins are now being heavily poached and sent to Asia. Um, as a result, now all eight pangolin spe species, wherever they're found, are threatened with extinction. Uh, and I would add some critically so. Um, so what is the center doing to protect pangolins? Uh, first, in 2015, we petitioned to get pangolins protected under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. And while the vast majority of demand for pangolins is in Asia, Products containing pangolin scales can still be occasionally found for sale online here in the U.S. These are endangered species after all, so we want to totally shut down any U.S. market. Um, second, we work at the international level under CITES, the trade treaty. And in 2016, the CITES parties voted to ban commercial international trade in pangolins. Yay, it was great news. Um, unfortunately, the trade continues, particularly in China, 
where the sale and consumption of pangolin scales for medicine remains legal. Um, so in 2019, um, we actually saw the largest pangolin seizure ever, um, was equating to about 38,000 individual pangolins in a single haul, so in one seizure, just really incredible numbers. Um, so in August, the center and our allies used one of the last tools in our toolbox. We filed what's called a Pelly petition. And this is a formal request to the US government to certify that China is violating the CITES treaty for its pangolin trade. And under US law, if China is certified, the president can use economic pressure or sanctions to ban certain wildlife products from China until China cracks down on its trade. Um, and these pellet petitions are one of the few legal avenues we have to address trade in foreign nations. Um, so I'm gonna jump off pangolins and jump to uh, sea cucumbers really quick. I just wanted to give a little mention to um, to the lowly sea cucumber, which is one of the African sea creatures we work on. Um, I'm not sure anyone would call these guys cute, but I, I think they deserve cool looking. Um, many have great names. In this picture, we've got the pineapple sea cu cucumber, the chocolate chip or the Cuido sea cucumber, and the rather unfortunately named warty sea cucumber. Um, but regardless of their, their obvious charm, uh, these little guys are really threatened. They are quite popular in Asia, um, considered to be one of the eight culinary treasures of the sea. And they are typically sold dried and then rehydrated for consumption. Um, demand has really skyrocketed in recent years. Um, uh, trade's gone up by about 500% since the 1950s. And that's put a lot of pressure on the sea cucumber populations. And many sea cucumbers, including the black tea fish, uh, which is a charmer, I promise, um, is, and a sea cucumber off of Africa's eastern coast are now endangered. Um, so what is the center doing to protect cucumbers? The now familiar refrain, we saw endangered species at protections for the black tea fish this year. Um, three more sea cucumbers were given CITES protections last year, and we're hoping to get more listed in coming years. I wanted to end by noting that there are other creatures in Africa we work on. Tanya's gonna, gonna do the, the big whopper at the end, of course. Um, but I did wanna just, just mention this cute little pancake tortoise. Um, it's this great turtle with sort of a soft shell that wedges itself between rocks for protection. Um, and I picked this turtle to end with because it's in the pet trade, including here in the US. And I just really wanted to emphasize that um, wildlife trade is not an issue that we here in the United States can just point fingers on. Um, yes, I know that most of my presentation and most of the trade in pangolins and sea cucumbers is really about demand in Asia. But here in the United States, we do have our very own huge demand for wildlife. Um, we're one of the biggest importers in the pet trade. Around 80% of aquarium fish plucked from the coral seas come here. We are the world's biggest importer of seafood, and we too consume wildlife for medicinal products. So yes, we need to press China and other nations to reduce trade in imperiled wildlife, but I really need to emphasize that we also have to do that here at home. Thanks, Sarah. And I'll just second that. I don't think most people realize what a role the United States plays in wildlife trade and that if we take action, we can make a difference to help protect animals from around the world. Okay. Well, that's the end of the weirdos. And I didn't know about the chocolate chip sea cucumber. <laughs> I think that's up there with the orange, but pimple back pearly mussel, which is a freshwater mussel for like biggest weirdo. But anyway, moving on to more charismatic species. Tanya, tell us about your work to protect elephants. I could spend the whole rest of the night talking to you guys about elephants, but I promise I won't do that. So I'm going to focus in on just a couple things that we're doing on the elephants tonight. Um, but I just wanted to start with a little bit of background on elephants. Um, I think most people know this, but poaching is a huge problem for elephant populations. Between 2007 and 2014, elephant numbers plummeted by 30%. In 2016, Africa's elephant population had seen the worst declines in 25 years, with a loss of approximately 1,100,000, sorry, 111,000 elephants over the previous decade. 
The Great Elephant Census, and that's what the slide is about, um, in 26, 2016 estimated populations of savanna elephants at around 350,000 animals. And that excluded a handful of countries that didn't let them survey. Now I wanna pause for a second because I just said savanna elephants and some of you might be scratching your heads, but it's really important to remember there's actually two species of elephants in Africa. Savanna elephants, which are you can see are in the dark green range and forest elephants, which are found predominantly in Western and Central Africa, that's the light green color. And I included a picture of a forest elephant that looks a lot like a savanna elephant, but it has just slightly smaller ears. It's usually a slightly smaller size body. And they are really, really critically threatened with extinction because of poaching. So what is the center doing to work for elephants? I bet you guys can guess. <laughs> well, and I wanted to just highlight two parts of our work that are a little bit different from everything else we've been talking about. We've talked a lot about CITES and getting species listed, but CITES has protected elephants for a long time. This is the international agreement that resulted in the ivory ban in the 80s. But we obviously still have a poaching crisis. And so one of the questions that has sort of um, asked is why? And one of the big reasons why we still have poaching going on is because we still have ivory markets in countries all around the world. So we've done a lot of work at CITES to push for countries to close their domestic ivory markets. And this really uh, originated back in 2016 when we had announcements from the United States and from China that they agreed together to close their domestic ivory markets. And that actually created a sea change around the world. We have countries, major ivory market countries all around the world that have closed their markets, but there's one notable exception and that's Japan. And so you guys probably will hear from us in the future about different efforts that put pressure on Japan to try to get them to close their market. The other thing that we're doing on the ivory front um, is again, just stressing this message that elephant belongs, that ivory belongs to elephants is trying to stem off any attempts at CITES to hold either ivory sales or to open up the ivory trade. Again, you can sort of see how our work on domestic markets closing can really help say, why would you have a sale if there's no one who wants to be your buyer? If all these markets are closed, who wants to buy ivory? And that's ultimately the goal. We have to cut down consumer demand for ivory. Not only does it help elephants stay alive, but it really also helps with cutting down on trafficking or illegal trade in elephant ivory. There's one other thing about keeping ivory with elephants is unfortunately, given the, per the current pandemic, we are starting to hear reports and get news of an uptick in poaching of elephants and lots of wildlife actually in Africa as a result of the pandemic. There's been a tremendous job loss and funding losses because of ecotourists not going to the country. No one's able to travel right now. So if you see an opportunity to take a virtual safari, or if you're thinking about making a donation to a park or a refuge or anti-poaching efforts in Africa, now's the time absolutely to do it. So there's some one other piece of our work on elephants that I did want to stress because we've done a lot in fighting trophy hunting of elephants. Um, we use domestic laws here in the U.S. to try to do what we can to benefit the species. So first off, the Center and Allies filed a lawsuit over then Secretary Zinke's, what we've called his Thrill Kill Council. This was the pro-trophy hunting FACA committee. And we tend to think that our lawsuit actually helped spur the decision by now Secretary Bernhardt not to continue that council. So we no longer have a whole big group of trophy hunters that are advising the US government on how it should allow more trophy hunting imports from imperiled wildlife all around the world. The second thing that we did, and this slide really focuses on this, as many of you know, we sued when the Obama era decision to ban trophy imports from Zimbabwe was reversed. I have to tell you guys, unfortunately, we didn't prevail in that lawsuit, but I think our work did a lot to educate people about the horrors of trophy hunting. It really helped elevate the issue and it did so across the aisle. There are people all over who got upset about that decision. So rest assured, we're gonna keep on fighting against trophy hunting. You know, as we all know, and as we started talking out about, or started talking about at the beginning of this, we're in the midst of an extinction crisis. We can't just let a small group of vocal, primarily white wealthy trophy hunters continue to kill species that are at risk of extinction. 
We need to be working together to figure out how to protect these species, not plotting how best to kill them. And I want you guys to know that you should rest assured that we're gonna keep on fighting for elephants as well. Thanks, Tanya. Can you also talk about your work to protect leopards? I would be happy to. You know, my running joke with Sarah is, you guys, I think leopards are like the ugly stepchildren of Africa. They just don't get the attention that they deserve. Look at that leopard. He's hiding up in that tree and he or she has the strength when they kill a pretty sizable ungulate species to haul it up in that tree to make sure that no other predators get that species. They are beautiful animals. They are magnificent if you ever get to glimpse one in the wild. And we have some amazing pictures. A lot of, of the pictures actually came from our government affairs director. So I hope you guys enjoy them. But unfortunately for leopards, way back in, in 2015, um, leopard scientists really sounded the alarm that leopard populations around the world are declining. And that included, or excuse me, leopards in Africa. Leopards are threatened by habitat loss and fragmentation. We have a growing human population that's taking over space, but they're also increasingly coming into conflict with people. Again, as we take over habitat, um, people and leopards come in touch. And as we graze more livestock, they make tasty treats that leopards want just as people want. And it creates a lot of controversy. So Conflicts with people and persecution of leopards by people is a huge factor for leopards. But they're also still being killed and illegally in many instances for their skins. And trophy hunting is a confounding factor and sometimes can be a real issue in terms of actually either eliminating leopard populations or certainly put the, putting them at close to um, being locally extirpated. So I want to focus mostly on the work that we've done at CITES. And you guys, it's Sad to say this, but it's unfortunately not a, it's not a, it's not a rah-rah story, but I think we're going to do everything we can for leopards in the future. So I want to explain this to you guys because it does explain how sometimes politics gets in the way of science. And I think that's something that you hear from us a lot. And this is one of those examples. So at CITES, leopards get the highest protections. They're listed on Appendix 1. And that means there's a ban in commercial trade in the species. This protection is reserved for the species that are the most imperiled. But unfortunately, CITES has a huge loophole. Even for the most imperiled species, species like black rhinos, trophy hunting is still allowed. So after commercial trade and leopards was banned, they were thought to have increased populations in Africa as a result of that ban. And the parties to CITES agree to set what's called a quota. It's an annual limit for how many hunting trophies and skins could be traded. The quotas were based on a model that we now know was faulty. It vastly overestimated leopard populations in Africa based on rainfall. And I think most of us today are like, what, how could that happen? <laughs> but it did, and, and that's how, that was the basis for these quotas. Fortunately, CITES recently undertook a review process of the quotas, and this is where the story takes a sad turn. It turns out that out of all of the countries with quotas, only one undertook a comprehensive study of its leopard population, actually really started monitoring leopards, which is hard to do, and that was South Africa. And South Africa is really thought to be the stronghold for the species in Southern Africa, but it turned out when when they dug in and actually started paying attention to their leopard population, it was declining by 8% each year. And South Africa suspended trophy hunting. Now, despite those clear facts that say, oh my gosh, we need to be stopping and looking and listening and paying attention to what's happening to leopards, the CITES party sustained these quotas for leopard populations around the country, even though none of the other countries with leopard quotas were actually doing the work that South Africa had done. That's where things stand right now, but you guys, I want you to rest assured that we're going to continue to push for leopards to receive better protections, both at CITES and here at home. So definitely pay attention for future actions and in the future that you can take for leopards. And, you, and I also encourage you to check out these species, get to know them a little bit. They're really amazing cats and they are very deserving of our attention. Thanks, Tanya. So at the, towards the end of the webinar, I always ask our panelists, how can our members at home help? So what do you have? Well, we have, a, we have a whole bunch of different actions you guys can take. So as you sort of noted from our, from our presentation, um, one of the big things that we 
always want to stress with our members is to think about what you're buying and, and what your friends and your families buy, because we unknowingly bring a lot of wildlife products into our homes. And so as you sort of saw from some of the things that Sarah and I were showing this evening, there's a lot of products that are made out of wildlife, including imperiled species. So definitely, I think as a first step, pay attention to that and make sure that you're not buying a giraffe bone carving of a beautiful, long, tall giraffe that's actually made out of a giraffe femur. Um, there's a lot of things like that to be on the lookout for. And then as Sarah mentioned, we did do a, a big report that talked about wildlife trade and pandemic risk. And we encourage you guys to get engaged with the center and support our call to ban wildlife trade. Um, so we can send you the link for the action alert, but it's really crucially important to get involved in that. As, as Sarah said, not only is it a concern for, for the disease risk factor, but it also is a big concern in terms of the biodiversity crisis. Exploitation is a big problem for marine species and for terrestrial species. And we want you guys to work with us to try to make sure that we can draw down that risk as best we can here in the US. Sarah, what do you think? Do you have more ideas on how people at home can get involved? You know, I think that those are, are really great ideas. And I think as Sonia said, you know, keep an eye out. You know, we, uh, most years, as we're getting ready for the next CITES meeting where the parties decide sort of what, what species are gonna be on the agenda and what, are, what, what species that are gonna consider for listing. We usually do an action alert to our members to try to get them to weigh in to protect all sorts of, of you know, critters great and small to the United States to try to get them behind um, some of these proposals. So you know, keep an eye out. We, we do a fair amount of action alerts and um, in, from the international program. So. Awesome. Thank you, too. Now we're going to take some questions from the people on the webinar. And if we don't get time to answer your question tonight, then Sarah and Tanya will be on Slack tomorrow. And in the email you'll get after this, in addition to the action alert, there will be in a link to instructions on how to join Slack so you can chat with us tomorrow from noon to one Pacific. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing and take a look at your questions. All right, this is kind of a specific question. Why does CITES allow Botswana to kill their elephants and not protect them? Um, so CITES actually only regulates international trade in wildlife. Um, and so it's, it recognizes explicitly that it's up to all of the member countries to be their own best protectors of their wildlife. And so it doesn't actually have the legal authority to sort of come into Botswana or any other country and tell, tell that, that government that they can't do something as horrible as culling elephants or um, any other activities. Here's a question that I actually wanted to ask. Um, a lot of times you hear people say that hunting helps animals in Africa because it brings money for conservation efforts. And does that truly help or does it just placate the hunters? And what do you say to the people who, who say that? I have a lot of things to say. Let me try to keep this short. <laughs> you know, the trophy hunters love to say that they fund conservation. And in reality, there was a great report that was done by economists at large that looked at the numbers and found that if overall ecotourism is somewhere between, you know, three to six percent of uh, GDP of a country, trophy hunting is like 0.02% of that benefit. It is minuscule, it's really tiny. And unfortunately, unlike tro uh, like ecotourism, trophy hunting is really pretty minimal in terms of the people that it employs, the jobs that it offers. It's, you know, the way that it sort of um, interweaves local communities and conservation together. So hunters like to think that they're great conservationists. They like to think that they fund conservation, but the reality of the numbers on the ground is totally different. Another question. Our members are taking CITES to the task tonight. So CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, why would they need to be directed or encouraged to do more to protect endangered species? And is CITES politically influenced? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, CITES is the treaty, um, which, which lays out um, 
basically two things. You, species can either be put on Appendix 1, which means that there is a trade, a, a ban on commercial trade, or they can be put on Appendix 2, which is um, trade is regulated. But CITES is made up, so that's the treaty. Um, the party societies are the 186, I think it is, nations who have um, acceded to that treaty. Of course, the United States is one, pretty much every, every country in the world. Um, so a lot of what Tanya and I do is, is we go to these meetings. Um, you know, there's like a big one every three years. And at these big meetings, um, all of the different parties propose and get to vote on which species should be covered and which shouldn't. And it is incredibly political. Um, it is, it's, it's can, can be honestly pretty disturbing to watch. Um, yes, yeah, so there is a lot of advocacy, um, a lot of lobbying, and, and that is a lot of what we do. We, we start now, the next meeting is at this point planned for um, spring of 2021. We're already putting together sort of what our wish list is and um, starting to talk to countries about some of the, the you know, legal decisions that we think that they should vote on when the next CITES meeting comes up. Lots and lots of questions about CITES. Um, do they have any enforcement capability or can they only negotiate with governments and can they impose sanctions? And these are great questions because I don't work internationally, so I have no idea. <laughs> I love that question. Can I answer it, Tony? You can, yeah. <laughs> Whoever asked that, come join the international program. <laughs> the reason that, like, the, the way that we pick what we do and what treaties we work on is how many teeth they have. Um, and CITES is considered a successful treaty in part because it does have teeth. It actually has a way to sanction countries who violate the, the treaty. Um, so uh, if a country is in violation, and it, it, it needs to be pretty bad violation, it's not just like, you know, have a little bit of a problem here and there. Um, if, it's, if it's a pretty significant compliance issue, um, the countries can propose and then they discuss and they give, you know, they, they provide measures for the country and if they still just can't get it together, um, CITES, the CITES parties can come together and vote to um, prohibit trade in any CITES listed species, which there are 30,000, 36,000 CITES listed species. It's a lot. So that could be a pretty severe sanction. Um, I know what Tanya is about to say, so I'm going to say it before she does. The interesting thing about it, though, is that if you look at the countries that are under trade suspensions, is what they call it, it's all developing countries. And sure, some countries with big problems, don't get me wrong, but you don't see CITES taking action against China. And China has a lot of issues. You don't always see them taking against Japan or um, Mexico has, has some pretty big trade issues too. Um, so unfortunately, CITES, instead of, all, they, they tend to, 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 to pick on, on the developing nations instead of also focusing on demand nations that are some of the more developed world. Did I, did I do it, Tanya? Did I see it? You did it, you did it. <laughs> okay, for now, that's the end of the CITES questions, but we have an ESA question. Last August, significant changes, improvements were made to the Endangered Species Act. Will those changes hinder, hinder the center's international work? I would say not much. <laughs> um, Tanya, feel free, and, and you, tier two, feel free to disagree. Um, you know, the way the Endangered Species Act applies to foreign species is much more limited than it is to domestic species. There are protections, like we talked about, right, that, that this prohibition on import, that's huge. Um, but the uh, protections for critical habitat, totally essential for domestic species, doesn't apply at all. The, you, the Endangered Species Act is not interpreted to allow us to, to designate, you know, critical habitat in Botswana, unfortunately. Um, so a, a lot of the provisions just don't apply in the international realm. Um, you know, most of the benefit that we get from the ESA for our program is really on important trade um, and highlighting and the, the threat and, and funding. So do, Tanya, do you have adding or telling me I'm wrong? No, I totally agree with that. And even when the changes were made to the petition regulations, um, which made it so much more onerous for citizens to petition for protections for species, those same requirements don't apply for the foreign listed species. So for example, having to go out and do consultations, that only applies to states in the US. It doesn't apply to countries around the world. So somehow or another, we got a little bit lucky in the international program in terms of how some of these changes affect us. But that doesn't mean we don't have the back of, of all 
all the great people in the center who are working to try to get those changes overturned because that is ultimately really crucial for, for biodiversity as a whole. And not just within the center, but states too. A lot of states stood up for the Endangered Species Act and filed a lawsuit opposing those changes. So <laughs> we're gonna stay in court over that one for a while. Um, I don't know if you'll know this one. It's a specific question about dogs. It says like in Namibia, they use dogs to help prevent cheetah predation. Can that help mitigate the human leopard conflict? Ooh, that's a good question. I haven't heard about that. Um, I'll definitely look into it. You know, it's really interesting. There's a study um, that came out pretty recently and they found that painting like just fake eyes with like black and blue paint on, on the butts of livestock actually helped reduce lion predation because they felt like they were watching them from both angles and there wasn't a good way for them to like sneak up and approach them. So there's a lot of really creative ways that people are dealing with um, human wildlife conflict in Africa, but I haven't heard about the dogs yet. I will look into that. But I didn't know about the painting of eyes, but that's like a classic caterpillar or butterfly trick is to make it look like there's eyes yeah. on both ends to keep something from eating you. I love it. It's, it's worth a Google for sure. Yeah, it, they're really cute pictures. <laughs> Along those lines, and this is just a question I'm throwing in there, Tara Easter, if you're watching us, hello, Tara um, used to be a biologist on our staff and she left to go get her PhD and she'll probably come back, but she used to do this amazing work with elephants and bees to reduce conflict. Tanya, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's a really, really cool study um, and it's actually getting implemented in, in a number of different places, but basically one of the big conflicts with elephants and people is they love to raid crops, you know? It's like, oh, you grew this amazing field of food for us. Thank you so much. I'm gonna walk on in there and, you know, eat. And if you've ever seen a place where elephants have fed, I should have included one of these pictures. They are not delicate. They rip up trees, they make big messes, um, they paw, they dust. And so the sort of, the carnage from when an, a herd of elephants goes through an area is, can be really significant. Um, and which is crucial for the ecosystems, right? They play a crucial role in sort of changing how everything looks. And that's really important to the evolution of places where elephants came from. But when humans are there and they, they do that same thing to a field of crops, it creates a lot of problems. So the idea behind the study is, it turns out elephants are actually terrified of bees. Um, they're also terrified of of rats in captivity, but that's a whole different story that we won't get into today. But yeah, bees, and because bees in part can find really sensitive places on elephants, up their trunks, their ears, all sorts of areas, and sting them. And so they are a great deterrent from elephants going into crop areas. And so they've started working on setting up beehives around crucial areas where they don't want them to, to enter, and it's been terribly effective. And it's also a really cool way that you can not only save your crops, but maybe get a little honey as well. And so you can sometimes at stores in the US find products that are made out of what are called elephant um, safe bee products. And those are, those are the bees that are defending the crops and trying to keep the peace between the people and the elephants. I think you can also find paper made out of elephant poop because I think either you or Tara got me some one time. Yes. But anyway. <laughs> um, there's a question about ecotourism and can we use the ecotourism industry to pressure governments in Africa to preserve species? Definitely. I think that us in the U.S. can speak a lot with our dollars of where we go to visit and the resources that we put towards that. So yeah, if you ever think about taking a trip, you know, go to a place that has great protections for wildlife and, and enjoy it. And I know that your dollars will definitely benefit conservation. It's really crucial. If you look at a country like Kenya, for example, ecotourism is a huge part of their economy and it's incredibly beneficial for wildlife. Um, there was just a recent report about how well um, their elephant populations are doing there. And that's in part because of, of ecotourism. So yeah, we have a really significant role to play in, in visiting places. Someone asked about virtual safaris and how they can help. And I wanna put a little monarch butterfly plug in there while we're talking about it. The sanctuaries in Mexico, one of them already announced that they're not gonna open to international visitors this year because of the COVID-19 outbreak. And, the lost tourism revenue is going to play just it's going to devastate the community basically because so much income comes in when the butterflies are gathered there for the trees and so this group called butterflies and their people set up virtual monarch tours so you can pay to go on a virtual tour and help support the community so they don't have to log the trees 
Um, so anyway, tell us more about how the virtual safaris, how people can find out about them and how they can help. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly that same concept. And, you know, let's face it, I think it's really appealing to us, right? We've all been trapped in our houses for months and months and months. And um, if we can't leave and go on a vacation, at least we can take a, vir a virtual trip. And so I first heard about this where there are like museums like the Louvre in France and places like that were doing this. And, and I think the folks that do ecotourism projects are catching on. I know there's been some hiccups with um, virtual safaris in Africa because of the time difference. And so that's one of the things I don't have at my fingertips, the best resources for us in the States in terms of how to do that. Because I think some people are trying to do recordings and sort of take you along that way just with the time change. So um, I can definitely do some sleuthing and, and have some resources available on Slack tomorrow for folks. But I think you can do your own Googling as well because people are definitely figuring out how to make this work for for the US consumer, as well as for people um, in Europe who are in much closer um, to being the same time zone. So yeah, you can you can find it. Just make sure that you're clear that you're coming from the US and you're not gonna be getting up at two in the morning to go on safari. <laughs> but that would be a more realistic experience, wouldn't it? It would be, it would be. If you wanted to do a night safari, that would be how you would usually do it. <laughs> All right, Sarah, I think this one's for you. What's the status of the Pelly petition regarding pangolins? That's a great question. We just filed it in August, so um, just a couple months ago. Um, we know that it's already percolating through the administration. We know the State Department has taken interest. Um, we've gotten some questions about it. Um, so right now we're just following up and, and um, trying to, to move it up the chain to try to actually get a decision. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we have an administration right now that, that has a pretty, had a free hand with sanctions. Um, seems to be more open to them than, than uh, previous administrations. So, um, you know, this is a, a way to use sanctions to, to try to get some action um, to protect some species. So um, we're, we're, we're hopeful. And it's really a crucial time, you guys. China's actually been making a lot of changes to their wildlife laws. And so it does seem like part of the reason we did it is to strike while the iron's hot and really try to push them to go all the way in terms of what they're banning and how they're controlling wildlife in their, in their country. Here's a why question. The why questions are the hardest. Why was South Africa the only country that did a study of leopard decline? And I guess you could add, are other countries gonna do it now? I actually, that's an easy one for me in part because um, there was a lot of pressure and there was some funding that came in through an NGO called Panthera. And so they teamed up with South Africa to do this intensive leopard monitoring program. And I think they did it in part to develop it really as a model to show other countries that allow trophy hunting of leopards how this can be done. Um, and so there was tremendous pressure as we went through the review of the quotas at CITES for other countries to really follow what Africa, South Africa has done to learn from their experience. You know, they did all of the hard work to sort of develop the program, but you can easily take that program and, and, and implement it in other places. And so there was a lot of discussions around that and a lot of pressure on that. And that is the one part of the story that made me hopeful is I think the whole, some of this was designed to have that outcome be that, you know, the country should really band together. Um, we didn't really talk about it today, but there's a whole other convention called the Convention of Migratory Species. And they have uh, an agreement with CITES so the two work together. And it's interesting because they sort of go hand in hand. They end up internationally sort of making like our Endangered Species Act. Um, Convention on Migratory Species does a lot to protect habitat, ensure recovery of species. CITES deals with the, you know, not exploiting the species. And they've teamed up to create a, um, an African carnivore initiative that covers lions and leopards and wild dogs. Um, and cheetah. And so the hope is, I think, in part two, some of the work that was done in South Africa and leopards will get funneled into that process and really benefit the range countries, um, making sure that we're not over exploiting leopards, but then too adding in that that habitat element. So making sure that there co there's connectivity, there's places for them to go where they're not going to come into conflict with people. So that's a really long answer to the question, but it was a good question. And, and it actually was uh, one that was fun to answer because um, sometimes those why questions are really hard, but this one was sort of apparent. So we didn't really talk about fish tonight. We did talk about sea cucumbers, but I'm assuming that they're probably mollusks. Um, but Not there's fish. a question about, they are fish? No. No, okay, yeah, they're mollusks, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
So is, does the U.S. import fish from foreign countries and is the center getting involved in this? And I know that our, our Hawaii director, Max, does a lot of work on the aquarium trade, banning, trying to ban kidnapping fish in Hawaii. So we're going to have a future webinar with her, but tell us about the import scene. Yeah, so Tara's the question about seafood or about aquarium fish or just fish generally? It says endangered oh, fish. What's that? Both. It says endangered okay. fish. All right, so we're going to start with um, seafood, uh, fish that we eat. The U.S. is the largest importer of seafood in the entire world. About 90% of what, um, what people in the U.S. consume is actually imported seafood. So um, yes, we have a very, very uh, sizable import of, of fish. Um, yeah, I, I, I note that mostly because one of the other issues that I work on is marine mammals. And um, there's a new law, and one of the things that we spend a lot of our time on in the international program, um, a new law that says, um, as of next year, countries cannot export fish to the United States unless they meet the same requirements that we have in the United States to protect whales and dolphins from entanglement in fishing gear. And the U.S. has the strongest provisions of really anywhere in the world <clears throat> at this point for, for making sure that, that whales, dolphins, marine mammals don't get entangled in fishing gear. Um, so this is another way that, that um, the U.S. is kind of using its, its purchasing power to try to, to, to get other countries to step up and meet some of our conservation standards. Um, so we do actually do a lot of uh, work on seafood in that way. Um, but then as far as, uh, as aquarium fish go, once again, we're a biggie. Um, about 80% of coral reef fish that are in the uh, global market come right here uh, to the United States for the aquarium industry. And about 70% of corals that are in trade come right here for the aquarium industry. And we are absolutely the biggest importer, absolutely the biggest driver of that trade. It is a really bad one too. Um, it's virtually unregulated still. Um, there is only one species that's on the endangered, one um, aquarium fish species that's on the, the Endangered Species Act. That's obviously something we'd like to fix. Um, it's really not regulated under CITES yet. Again, something we would like to fix. Um, and the way that, that coral, reef, coral reef fish are often caught is through um, cyanide fishing. Basically, you like squirt cyanide out and then you capture whatever you can and it ends up really damaging the reef and killing a lot of fish. Um, and a lot like actually die as they, they are shipped here in captivity. So um, it's definitely an issue I clearly care a lot about. Um, one that's sort of on our list for, for where we see a lot of our actions going uh, to in the future. All right. Here's a question about if people contact their members of Congress and ask them to take action, action on an issue and the member of Congress says they don't sit on the responsible committee, what do you say? How do you keep pushing them? They still have a vote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. I mean, certainly if you're on a committee, you're going to have more influence. Um, but, you know, your congressman is your congressman and they, they, they have a vote on issues. I, I, I find that sort of crazy. Are there professional journals, preferably online, that you would recommend for the public to become aware and stay current on international species science? Mm. I would recommend signing up for the international- That's a Sierra question. Ask yeah. science. <laughs> no, no, I'm definitely gonna have you two answer it, but I get the International Union for Conservation of Nature email list. You can go to IUCN's website and they have so many email boxes that you can check to get information about this, that, or the other. So that's that's a great source of information, but I'm gonna let you two answer that. I also really like following um, authors. Like when I find someone who's done a study that I find to be helpful, following them on ResearchGate, and then you get little email notifications when they publish new things, or they sort of have an algorithm that picks out what they think um, might suit your interests and so they'll send you emails. Um, and that's also a good way to request things that maybe are behind paywalls. You can just ask the authors directly to, to, if you can get a copy of their piece, which can be helpful. And then I guess I would add, um, you know, not totally science, but National Geographic has just really fantastic media um, and kind of tracking their website and, and following along, they, they cover a lot of, you know, major wildlife reports, um, scientific reports, but also um, all sorts of other things. That's, that's a really great source for, for international wildlife news. You're going to like this question. Someone um, wanted more follow-up information about countering the argument that hunting helps conservation. They said, I get that argument a lot and I want to be able to refute it. What sources? 
do you have? Yeah, so that the Economist at Large report is definitely a really good one to take a look at. Um, and I can pull together some other sources and send them out on Slack tomorrow. We did a huge submission. I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but the UK is right now considering whether or not to ban um, trophy imports. And so we did a lot of work with Humane Society International on a submission and it's really a call for evidence on why they should do it. Um, so we have hundreds of pages of, of information, but it also covers that sort of economic part of it. Um, I think the other thing too, from just a conservation standpoint, that's interesting to think about with trophy hunting and a lot of instances, particularly in Africa, you don't, it's sort of like us, um, you don't have hunting in, in national parks. So hunting happens in, in reserves that are near those parks. And there's really a question about um, the utility of some of those areas for conservation. You know, it's, they're not like the, the canned hunting ranches we have in Texas, right? That just breed imperiled species for some hunter to come and shoot them in a, in a small fenced area. But in some of these instances, it's not too different from that. Um, and you really wonder, are these really truly wild animals that are actually contributing to, you know, the genetic diversity? Are they, do they have connectivity with the animals in the parks? Are they contributing um, genetically and otherwise? Or are they just sort of basically like a zoo population that people come in and shoot? So I think that's the other part of it. Biologically, there's a lot of questions around um, hunting reserves and how they function and the role that they play. Um, and then I think too, on the, um, on the economics, you know, it really is sort of as I said before, a really small part of the population that gets involved and that may potentially benefit from that. There are a lot of, um, you know, Afrikaners who, who run those places who tend to hire a lot of white people. And so it's not always a, an activity that benefits as much the local communities versus my experience going to national parks in, in Africa, you know, you have lots of lo local community members who come in and do everything um, and really benefit from the jobs that come about through ecotourism. And that's one of the big concerns of trophy hunting is it just doesn't necessarily have the same benefits for local communities. So we have about one or two more minutes. Um, someone asked about the Chinese wildlife law modifications that you mentioned. Are they mostly beneficial to wildlife and were they caused by COVID? Yeah, so there have been a couple changes within China. Um, so one was an announcement earlier this year, uh, maybe in March or so, um, that was a ban on um, consumption of wild animals, which uh, is, it, that goes farther than the U.S. has. Um, unfortunately, it had some exceptions, and one of those exceptions is um, for medicinal, traditional Chinese medicine purposes. So um, <clears throat> it was already illegal to uh, consume a pangolin in China because they are on the, the wildlife protection law list. Um, but uh, the, you can still, there's, there's a, a, a big loophole for, for traditional Chinese medicine. Um, and then we know that, as, as Tanya mentioned, um, the Chinese government is considering some changes to the wildlife protection law, but um, it, the, the, this loophole just really seems to remain about traditional Chinese medicine. So um, that's one of the big things that we're advocating for in the Pali petition. Um, you're not it, sure sanctions can be part of it, um, but really just in trying to get the U.S. to press China to, to make the changes that, that really could matter for pangolins, as well as for leopards and tigers and bears and lots of other uh, species that, that are in traditional Chinese medicine to close that loophole. Well, this hour went by really fast. Um, thank you so much, Sarah and Tanya, for being here. Thank you to Karina behind the scenes and to you at home for joining us. Next week on the 29th, we're going to talk about scary creatures and even scarier policies to attempt to gut their protections, including bats, American burying beetles, and a glowing orange arachnid called the Bone Cave Harvestman. So you don't want to miss that. Please join us. You're going to get an email with an action alert you can take to help end wildlife trade. Sarah and Tanya will be on Slack tomorrow at noon Pacific for an hour. And thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.